All right. Um, so for the afternoon session, we're going to have Stefan telling us about entropy and operator algebras. All right. Uh, thank you, uh, Nima. Uh, here's my plan. Uh, the um, curly uh, decora decorative uh, symbol indicates where I what is the uh, uh, a lower bound to where I want to get during these lectures. I, I don't really, uh, I'm not sure I have a, uh, my time management all, uh, uh, all sourced through so well. And it also depends a lot how many questions there are, how far I will get. Anyway, um, I think my talk is going to be one of the more formal ones, uh, formal in the, wor in the sense that uh, physicists use it, so formal being uh, uh, more mathematical. Um, but um, I've, I've been trying to think uh, what, what, what some of you may find useful. There's obviously a, a huge literature and a huge amount of material, uh, uh, much of which uh, is not, it wasn't at all uh, uh, invented in my, my research papers or, or, or in, in research papers that I, I have my name on, uh, which is not necessarily the same. And... Um, uh, therefore, I, uh, some of it is quite old, um, but maybe it's uh, still useful to some of you. I, I think um, the part that is sort of uh, 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 based on algebraic quantum field theory, you might uh, have been frustrated reading some of the papers because they, they, they seem to um, uh, they seem to, to, to try to confuse the enemy by using a totally different language. And, and it's sort of, it's an, it's sort of uh, for years, been a, a, a club of Illuminati, so just talking to each other. And, 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 and that's, you know, that, that, that happens in many areas of science, of course. Um, but but, but so, so if, if, if I yield the temptation to, to fall into that jargon, please stop me, and, and I'll, I'll do my very best to, to, to relate it to. Also, notation-wise, I... Uh, it's it's very easy to confuse people just by notation. So if if some notation looks unfamiliar, then then please let me know. Okay. So first of all, I want to um, talk about en entropy and relative entropy. Of course, of course, you know what is entropy. Well, well uh, of course, nobody knows what's entropy. But but there, there's there's a uh, you know th there's a formula that is written down. Uh, and, and my logarithm is the natural natural base e. Uh, and so, so that's just a classical probability distribution. But of course, the eigenvalues of a density matrix are just um, are just the classical probability distribution. So for S, it doesn't actually matter whether quantum or classical, you know, just for this formula. But but there, the, so so the way that you can uh, interpret this is is that it's the average surprise. Uh, so what I mean by surprise is is if you, Uh, so I'm sure you know this. this so, 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 so if you have, an, uh, have a probability uh, distribution with a very rare event, like winning the lottery, then if you actually win the lottery, you're surprised. Well, you should be surprised. Um, um, so, so, so the surprise should be something like one over the probability. Um, um, but, but the surprise should also be additive, um, because if you have independent events and you win the lottery once and then next year again, you know, you're not you're not surprised squared, but but you're sort of surprised plus surprised. So so, so the logarithm makes it additive, and and then the average is that of course you have to to average over all possible events. So 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 relative entropy. So this is all classical. Is is sort of relative. Average surprise. Um, so, so it works like this. So, so suppose you. So you suppose you believe. The probability distribution is QI. Uh, but uh, let's uh, let's say it actually is. PI. Uh, so, so then. Then my surprise. So l let's say I am I am wrongly believing it's QI. So then my surprise uh, 
is uh, would be um, the sum p i log uh, q i because um, that's my surprise but but this is the sort of uh, a relative frequency it actually happens so so that's my, that's the relative that's my average surprise but the, uh, the real surprise Uh, should of course have been this one, which is pi log um, over pi, and so if you take the difference, uh, then uh, between uh, the the true surprise and and the uh, so if you take that difference log. Uh, you get this uh, famous formula for the for the relative entropy, which is p i log of uh, p i over q i. So, so that's the relative entropy for classical probability distribution. So, so it's it's not uh, it's metric if you uh, uh, between what you what is actually true and what you believe is true. So that that's a frequent experience in life that somehow the world is not symmetric between what you want or what you believe and, and what actually is. Um, so so to, uh, uh, to, to appreciate the sort of intuitive meaning, I invite you to consider the, uh, the two cases where, where, where you believe a coin is fair, but it actually is totally unfair. So, so the true probability is distribution is, is zero for, for heads and, and one for, for tail. Uh, and, and then the opposite case, and, and then psychologically you will, you will see the asymmetry uh, uh, and why, why in one case the difference between the surprises is, is much larger than in the other. Uh, I don't want to go into this, but, but this sort of this is uh, uh, sometimes good to have a psychological uh, understanding of things. So, so that the, why I'm saying this is sort of, you probably all have seen this at some level, why I'm saying this is the following reason. So that the, this, this, there is an operational meaning in the background And so, so this, this relative entropy is usually written. So the annoying thing is that people, you have different conventions w for which is first and which is second. So my convention is this. So the operational meaning is, is, is like this. So suppose you have events, x1, x2, uh, and xn uh, drawn from from an event set A, which is sort of uh, maybe A, B, and so on, so C. And um, so these, the probabilities would be of these, um, let's say, are P A, P B, P C. And um, so let, let's define CP to be um, uh, it's a subset of drawings of n elements according to leading to this probability distribution the PA. PB. So, so mathematically, it's it's uh, the set of x1, xn in the power set such that um, the relative frequency uh, of A is uh, PA, of B is PB, and so on. So, so that's obviously a subset of all possible uh, events. So it's, 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 it's those drawings such that you have the exact relative frequency of every, any, every, any event that you'd expect according to the given probability distribution. And now if you believe the probability distribution to be Q, you can compute the probability based on Q that this of this set, so this is obviously a subset of all possible drawings, 
and, and there's a, a, a theorem that this scales as e to the minus s of p and q. So, so, so this gives a sort of, if you think about it, an operational interpretation of what this s is. So now let's um, talk about quantum. If I write down here, can you still see that? Yeah. So quantum, of obviously the, 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 the probability distributions should become density matrices. So, so maybe um, P I becomes some density matrix rho and, and rho I QI becomes some density matrix sigma. Uh, but now rho and sigma don't have to commute. And, and so you can diagonalize one or you can diagonalize the other, but you, it's, it's not obvious that, you know, how you should generalize this formula anymore because you can't, you can't diagonalize them at the same time. And, and so, so the, in fact, there are different pro proposals for what the relative entropy should be in the quantum case. And so, so, so the, so Umegaki in the 60s, he, he proposed to take um, S of uh, rho and sigma to be um, the trace of rho log, uh, rho minus the trace of rho log and sigma, which obviously uh, gives this formula if, if both, uh, uh, both density matrices are, are simultaneously diagonal. But um, there, 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 there are others. Uh, so there's, for example, this, uh, what is it called? Belavkin, Stasevsky. I uh, apologize if, if I don't spell this right. Um, and, and this one I have to look up myself so because it's, it's so unfamiliar. It's uh, supposed to be, so umegaki and S. Belavkin Stasevsky. And that's supposed to be minus the trace of uh, 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 rho. You see, yeah, I think it's rho and then log of um, uh, uh, one over root rho uh, sigma one over root rho, something like this. So, so this also becomes the same formula if, if the density matrices commute. So, so you may ask why should you take this or that, or you, there, there, there are doubtly, undoubtedly many other uh, generalizations. And, and the, from what I understand, the reason why, why eventually people um, settled on this one here is that it has this, um, this operational uh, meaning at, uh, in a suitable quantum sense, which I can't explain here, but, 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 but sort of this has an operational meaning and at least it's not known to me or I've, I've heard, I've asked experts and they've, they, they've assured me it's not known whether this has one, at least not a straightforward one. So, um, so therefore from now on I will, uh, I will focus on this one like most people. But, Sorry, but Stefan, a yeah. quick question. Uh, right here. Who's asking? <laughs> <laughs> Just localize. Um, what, what do you mean by operational meaning? I mean, it, it, it's well, def like it's defined, so I can just use it. Yeah, something like this sort of sort of way where you can, where you, where you can can kind of um, uh, design a task, you know, such 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 that the so, 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 um, probability at succeeding this task is is sort of expressed in terms of of, of such an entropy, like, or. Uh, but I mean. So, so I'm a little bit confused. So you, you do you, so you have this is just for this is for the classical entropy. What I described was for the classical entropy right. anyway. So so that they they are indistinguishable anyway at the classical uh -huh. at the classical level. Right. Uh, but but what sort of it's 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 a, the, the idea that that sort of that you can come up with with some with some task such such that the entropy gives sort of the average uh, uh, average success rate of, of uh, for, for this task something like this. Maybe don't press me so hard on it because I, uh, 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 I think it would maybe maybe we can discuss that okay, sure, afterwards. Yeah, so I think it's uh, going off in a bit orthogonal direction. Okay, thank you. Say. But but I wanted to say that um, it's not that this is 
So this has also. Uh, excuse me. Can you read the first thing that you wrote on the board? Umegulti. Umegaki. Umegaki. That's a name. Yes. That's a name. Yeah. Yeah. And on the right you have trace row log row man, yes, minus I have trace, trace row log, log row minus trace row log sigma. Okay. Thank and you. I, I can put them both under this under the trace if you really ah, want. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah, no other so question. these rows are density matrices, I believe. Yes. Yeah, so row, row. Yeah. So, so this very good. Thank you for. So, so I'm using. Um, I'm using row and sigma and omega and so on for density matrices. Okay. Yeah. So in the second definition, um, I don't understand the term inside log. Like sigma by rho, it is. So basically, the denominator is row because there is root row and root row. Yes. So, what do we mean by sigma by? Okay, uh, uh, but. So these are just operators. So you know. No. So I mean, I, what I don't understand is like, what is the motivation behind these two definitions? I mean. That's a very good question. Okay. So so that's a, so the motivation is uh, uh, that this so this kind of. Um, there's there's a key property of this relative entry. So there's several properties, but a key property that I will describe in the following is that that it, it decreases if you apply a channel to each to each density matrix, and and that's what you want from basically any entropy. But 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 that's a very general property that also holds for this one. But if if you were to sort of write maybe rho to the one over rho to the one quarter sigma, you know some other expression that gives the same for commuting matrices, that then this may not be satisfied. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and so, sorry, probably I missed something, but why writing the row like that helps? I mean, dividing sorry? one over, I mean, why writing it one over root row times sigma times one over root row helps? Why writing in that form helps? Uh, that's not at all obvious uh, okay. why that helps. Yeah. Uh, not at all obvious. Not not obvious at all. Yeah. Okay. Right. So now uh, to explain, get to to your point. I guess I should explain what is a channel. And um, yeah. So I'm coming to point two. And um, so so I'm I'm explaining it for matrices. So, so, so this is a lecture supposedly about von Neumann algebras, which are these infinite dimensional things. But, but many things I'll try to explain for matrices, and then and then try to explain what's, where where this matrix picture maybe doesn't doesn't work so well, or what what, what aspects of it are problematic in general. So, but for now I'm just have I just have matrices, and DPI stands for data processing inequality. Which are, is something I have to explain to you, and um, so A, uh, I, I just for for now all operators on some Hilbert space, so finite dimensional Hilbert space. So let's say C n and and um, states. Uh, so I just do this is in quantum mechanics. Are so the sort of the density? matrices. And as I said, I'll use letters rho, sigma, omega, and whatnot for this lowercase Greek. And so, so what are operations? So you can think of operations as acting on states, or you can think of them as acting on, on, on observables. Just as um, the time evolution, you can think in quantum mechanics or even classical mechanics. Uh, as, as sort of either you evolve observables uh, or you evolve the state, so the Sh Heisenberg or Schrodinger picture, or I think the other way around. So, so if you, if you, so you're much younger, most uh, on average, I think, uh, than me. So, so, uh, so for you, um, uh, 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 so, so probably your viewpoint is that you stay the same, and the world around is changing you. And, and so you're you're kind of in the Schrodinger picture, but I'm in I'm in the Heisenberg picture, unfortunately. So so, so I feel nothing is changing. You know, or nothing is changes. I'm just getting older. But so 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 this is the same thing. So I I define operations first on the observables, just like you define the Heisenberg evolution on on observables, 
uh, and, and but then it's trivial to 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 transfer it to to the states and so what are operations so we we can take an observable uh, uh, and then and and apply a unitary time evolution and i'm now i'm using these lowercase lowercase letters for uh, for for elements of this this algebra so on because we will also have super operators that are operators on a larger Hilbert space that are, but they are not in the, in the algebra so they, they they will not be lowercase letters so so this is like a a time evolution so u is unitary and the star i think this is unusual in in quantum mechanics you always put a dagger like like this uh, this sword kind of symbol but but uh, so just to um start confusing you. I'll, I'll put a star here because that's sort of the more common uh, co uh, common no uh, notation in, for, for operator algebras. Yeah, so, but it's the same, yeah? It's, it's the dagger, if you like. So, so this is, so you imagine that you, you, you cannot just, you don't just have one Hamiltonian, but, but you imagine you can sort of tune different Hamiltonians by, by coupling the system in with something else. And then you can sort of simulate different Hamiltonians. So, so the idea is that you're free sort of to design this unitary. So the unitary would be e to the i h t or something, wh where you, you can kind of design the Hamiltonian. And, and, and then there, there's the von Neumann measurement, PAP. So P is a projection. So on states, this would sort of correspond to the collapse of the wave function after you measured an eigenvalue of some operator, and then the p would be the eigenprojection for, for, for this operator. And then, and then the last thing is, is that you can, um, you can tensor with, with some uh, ancillary system. So instead of having one system, you, you think of, of sort of preparing uh, uh, identical copies, and that's sort of uh, enlarging this uh, to one. So let's so this is, um, these three I think are quite intuitive what they mean. But there, then there's a more abstract definition with, which I claim is the same. I guess I should. So, so you can combine these three So note that the last one is going from A to a larger operator algebra living on a on Hilbert space of, of dimension n times n. So 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 then you get you get by combining them in some arbitrary way you get uh, some some operation T. And um, it turns out that T is a general completely. Positive, positive map. Um, so, so T is, is uh, it takes uh, takes a B and gives something in A and is linear because each of these operations are linear. And and you see if you, if you have a an A which is positive, by which I always mean some operator which just have non non negative eigenvalues. So. And you can always write such an operator as B star B or, or, so, or B B star. Then this also has positive eigenvalues. This has positive eigenvalues, and this has positive eigenvalues. So, so this explains positive. So, so if if a greater than or equal to zero, by which I mean, you know that um, psi a. For all states psi. Then T. Oh sorry, I should call it B. B. And then T of B also is positive, but it it it's 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 got a stronger property, which is this completely. And um, the completely is the statement that um, so this is positive, and this is completely positive. 
which is the statement that um, if you take the sum with some coefficients, cj t of i i k i k j, then this is also positive. Sorry, that's not, yeah, so i and j. And for, um, and so this goes from one to some k, and k is uh, whatever, sorry, not so maybe n. So completely positive um, is the same as positive um, if you take this n to be one, um, but it's it's stronger. So so an example. I, so I have little exercises for you here. I, I'm not sure uh, whether in being in Florence you feel like doing my boring exercises or go to the see the Michelangelo stuff, but. But um, if, if you don't feel like seeing the Michelangelo stuff, you can uh, do little things. So I give you an example of a T. Uh, if you say this is um, uh, the trace of A, sort of B times one minus B. So you can, so you can show, you should show that this is, is positive but not completely positive. So completely positive is more. Okay, but, but now I, I was saying about the Schrödinger and the Heisenberg picture and, and to go between is, is very easy. Yes. What? What is what? Well, C and A are the uh, so C are just some coefficients, arbitrary coefficients, for any coefficients C i and any n. So another way of saying it is, if, if you have instead a matrix, a matrix of matrices, which is positive, then if you apply element-wise in the matrix, this T, then this should be, again, a positive matrix of matrices. Yeah, so it's sort of, it's the same. So, so, um, so you define the, yeah, and sometimes it's, it's assumed also that um, most of the time uh, that the, if you apply it to the identity operator of A of B, you get the identity operator of A. Uh, excuse me. Yeah. Just here, uh, just two clarifications. One is that when you mean C bar, it is C star, right? Oh the yes, I'm sorry. Okay. Yes, so this, this is <laughs> so star is dagger, and bar is star, and and and, and uh, bar is star. Yeah, <laughs> uh, and then the second uh, clarification is but, that but but also in quantum mechanics books, this is not uniformly done. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, the set of CIs has to be restricted in some way, right? Otherwise, I can always find some constant, some very highly negative numbers that will make this thing negative. No, for any Cs. I mean, if Ci can be any numbers, then why can't I have a special set of number that will multiply with the other part and make it negative? <laughs> because uh, it's a condition. Okay. It's asking that you shouldn't be able to do this. I see. Yeah, yeah. It's like a law, it's, it's stating what, what you shouldn't do, but, but maybe you do it nevertheless. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, okay. So, but I want to say that the, the Schrödinger picture version so you just say that uh, you, you, uh, you define the, the in the Schrödinger picture 
Uh, this should be the same as uh, the trace of uh, rho of t of a. So, so, so if, you, if in case t is a, is a unitary, is like a unitary, this is exactly the correspondence between the Schrödinger and the Heisenberg picture. So these are all trivialities. I, I just want to make, so the do this tilde always means that it's it's um it's in the it's in the Schrödinger picture. So, so to so to give you an example, so if t was uh, sending b to um, uh, 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 b tensor some other system c, uh, then uh, uh, t tilde is the partial trace on c. Yeah, for example. I, yes. I do have a question. Sometimes people talk about two positive maps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. So sometimes you only want this for n equal to two, um, or for any. You know, it's a less restrictive. Yeah. Mm. So you can also find a counterexample to that if 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 you put here a a two. Then it's it's two positive, but not three positive, or yeah, and so on. Yeah, okay. Now, so what's data processing inequality? DPI, so very, very fundamental uh, inequality. Uh, and it states that always a rho in sigma is greater than or equal to S of uh, rho and sigma for any channel T. So that's, that's called the data process. Why is it called data processing? Because you imagine that T can be so many things, so, so it, it can be a, so, a sort of a way to, to process data. And, and, and if, so we've learned that sort of S, S is a measure of distinguishability. of two states of rho and sigma. So th then if you have, th with this interpretation, uh, you can say that under, under T, the distinguishability decreases always. Uh, and, and, and so just um, people, I think, here are very familiar with the strong sub-additivity property. And, and, and this is something you can get from this very easily. Now, what is... Uh. So to obtain strong sub-additivity, sub what you do is you choose rho to be some density matrix of some system A, B, C, and you choose sigma to be um, rho A tensor rho B, C. So for example, rho A, so for example, rho B, C is the trace on A of rho A, B, C, and so on. And then you take the T, take T to be the trace over C. And then um, that's an, an exercise that uh, you should uh, prove that this gives, uh, reduces to the usual strong, strong sub-additivity, uh, which I don't want to repeat because some very uh, good lecturer has already written it on the board. But, but I think that's something that you can relate to. So, so it's, it's, you can think of it as, as, a, as a generalization of this, this property. Yes? Are, are there examples of positive maps that violate this? Uh, um, For two positive is true, right? I think this just even just for positive, possibly. It's true for positive. I think so. I hope nobody can prove me wrong here. I think it's just for po even just for positive. But many other things I would say uh, you need more. You need more. Okay. And and for for the proof that I'll give you because it's it's some. Um, it's related to some, some other things that are m more complicated things that I will do later. I'll, uh, 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 in that proof, I will use the, the, po the two positivity. Okay, are there any questions about this? <laughs> okay, good. So, 
So this is uh, something that, um, uh, I, uh, you know, the story Lieb, Lieb and um, uh, we found this in, in the strong subjectivity in the 70s and then people realized that there's this more general, general version and, and there are different, different ways to prove it, at least, uh, at least five or six, I don't know. But I'll give you one because it, um, it, it, it illustrates a number of techniques that are, that are, that are kind of useful in the business and I hope you maybe appreciate learning some of the, some of the tools of the trade this way. It's not that you cannot find that any, anywhere. You, 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 it's very easy to find in the literature. So, um, uh, so the proof has several steps, um, and then and then th those steps will give me the opportunity to introduce some some things that um, that I will use later. So first of all, if you have a density matrix rho, uh, then uh, you can consider its purification. Uh, you know how this works, so, so you, you, you figure out the eigenvalues. Uh, uh, you figure out the eigenvalues of, of this row. And so, so, uh, so row of... I think I, do, I don't need to explain this. Um, so this is called the, the pur purification. So, so the purification, if, um, if the original Hilbert space is, is let's say dimension n, then the purification is is uh, of dimension n squared, and um, so so you can you can think of the purification as as sort of a, the square root of rho, like a vector, in in a in a in a Hilbert space which which is which is sort of uh, 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 which has this this um, this entangled degrees of freedom as well. So, so I'll use kind of this notation if that's okay as well. So, but then, uh, on this bigger Hilbert space, uh, you can in which the purifications live. You can you can uh, you can define the the inner product to be just it's just um, the trace of z zeta eta. So this is the Hilbert Schmidt. In a product, is this confusing or it's kind of clear, isn't it? Yeah. All right. So, so this is the bigger Hilbert space, and um, and conversely, if you have a vector in this bigger Hilbert space eta, uh, uh, then you can look at the reduced density matrix. And I will always call this uh, omega eta. So it's you trace over over the over the entangled degrees of freedom. Okay, so this is just some notation. <coughs> now, what you can introduce is on this bigger Hilbert space. in which the purification lives, you can, you, you can define something called um, uh, the, the relative modular operator. And it's a super operator, so it, it, it takes two density matrices, and then um, you take, uh, now I should look how which way, so you, you take sigma and uh, rho inverse. So the bigger Hilbert space I is sort of uh, you can think of it as if, if the original Hilbert space was K, then it's something like K cross K because there's a tensor product in between here, right? So, so one are the entangled degrees of freedom and the other one are the original ones. And so, so this sigma acts on, on one factor and this rho acts on the other factor, or rho inverse. So I have to assume that rho is not, does not have zero eigenvalues for, for this definition. So this is called the relative modular operator. So this is just a fancy name. It, it, you know, you can, you can define it or you can't, but it, the useful, the use uh, of it is that you can, uh, you can 
so first of all, you can write the entropy, the relative entropy between rho and sigma in just in this uh, other way, which, which I always forget the signs. So it's minus, we take a, a rho here, and then you take the logarithm of delta, the sigma and rho, and you take a rho. Uh, and that's kind of an easy exercise because if you take the logarithm of, of a tensor product, uh, you get the, the sum of the logs from each, from each uh, factor because they commute. So if, do you want me to write this out or is this in, in this audience obvious? I, I'm not sure. <laughs> write it out, okay. So, so the logarithm of, of this delta, sigma and rho uh, would be log of sigma times identity minus identity times log of rho. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, I think then it's I think an exercise to see how this gives the relative entropy. So I leave this as an the rest as an exercise. So this delta is not is not an, an element of, of the observables because the observables only act in one on one tensor factor and not on the entangled degrees of freedom, let's say on this one. Whereas this, this, this delta is a s sometimes called a super operator. It acts on, on the entangled degrees of freedom and, and the original degrees of freedom at the same time. So it's, it's a super. Question? Sorry, question? Yes? So you introduced two relative entropies. This was the, this was the Omegaki relative entropy? Yes. How about the other one? Can you also write that in terms of the relative entropy? Uh, you can, yeah. Yeah, also, you know this. No, I, I, no <laughs> how, do, how do you write it actually? M maybe we could discuss maybe it later. later, yeah. Thank you. So this is supposed to give us the Umezaki, like once we put it, plug in everything, yes. uh, what analog of the earlier relative entropy formula would this give us? So are I you didn't hear this. Are you defined, like is this the definition of now the purified like the bigger Hilbert space or? Yeah, so my bigger Hilbert space is you just, this is the original Hilbert space, let's say C to the N by N by N matrices on which the, op, you know, on which this acts irreducibly. And then you just tensor in the entangled degrees of freedom. And that's now my dif the definition of, of my bigger Hilbert space. And, and that's more convenient to work with. Uh, and on this bigger Hilbert space, you now have operators that act on both the original degrees of freedom and on the entangled degrees of freedom. Right, and, and does it have an analog with, with the two other definitions you gave before? Like, does it correspond to one of those or is it completely independent? Yes, so, so, so the, maybe I didn't, so this is the same formula. So this, this reduces to trace of rho uh, log rho minus uh, rho log sigma. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I, sorry. I, I, I'm not, I don't intend to use the same symbol for different things. It's oh, still okay, the yeah. same. It's, yeah. it's this Omegaki thing. And, and yeah, but we forget about the other, the other ones as, and, and we, we can resurrect it when we need it because the other one is also useful. But, okay, thank but you. for now, we, we always work with this one. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, I didn't say that very clearly. Wait, so a clarification question. So do the super, the super operators live in, the linear operators on a Hilbert space? On, you know, on, on the Hilbert space, com which is the tensor product of the original Hilbert space on which these matrices act irreducibly, tensored with the entangled degrees of freedom. Why, why super though? Like, can I consider k, k cross k as my Hilbert space and then they're just operators or is that not right? Yeah, uh, forget about the super then. And it's just I wanted to emphasize this, this is not in the, in the algebra in, in itself the it, because the algebra only acts on one tensor factor. And the commutant acts on the other. In the, other the original factor. algebra. You yeah, mean. yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so if you, maybe I, 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 was, I thought it would clarify things, but, but it just confuses things. So forget about the super then. It's just a linear operator. Right. So now that, that is the, the modular operator. That's just a name. But, but you can do interesting things with it, even for matrices. Um, Uh, 
Um, so, so the first, the, the second idea is, um, so this is idea one or whatever is the definition or idea one. But now comes another idea. A and this idea is, um, so you set rho, to rho prime to be the, the image of, uh, of, uh, of rho under the channel and sigma prime to be the image of sigma under the channel. So, so what you want to show then is that S of, um, of rho and sigma is greater than S of rho primed and sigma primed. And um, you do something, so you define uh, some operator V, and this idea is really due to Petz. So Petz uh, had this idea. Um, to, to, you do like this, so you define A, A is, is just a matrix from your algebra, uh, multiplying rho primed, you define this to be T of A uh, acting on rho. And so this, uh, you do this for any A, and because uh, you assume that rho and rho prime has no zero eigenvalues, so by left multiplication then I can get any, any matrix here. So this is, this is a good definition of how this V acts on, on, this, doubled, uh, on this doubled Hilbert space. And um, so th this, this is sort of a, a nice trick due to pets because uh, you, can, uh, you can work out that, uh, that V the operator norm on V on this bigger Hilbert space, so I call it H, just this time. In the following, I'll drop it, but so this is H, and this is the Hilbert space inner product of on H. So that this is less than or equal to one, and that uses the completely, or the two positive nature of T. And, and um, I just walk you through how you prove that. Um, yes. A is from A. So A are just the matrices that act on K, and 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 so if I act on K, that's sort of the same thing as as left left multiplication here. Is that, only on, that first only on the first factor? But but sort of, I'm you know this is I identify you know this is a matrix, so it would have two indices and one index I associate with K and the other with the other tensor copy of K. I never found a good, I think this abstract index notation that you know from, from, from Cambridge and Wald, I think that's probably the best to write it, but, but I, I uh, uh, so this is in H. Sorry, so, so do you mean it's like A ten, tensor yeah. identity? Yeah, so, so A on this is the same as A on this. So the Hilbert space itself is <laughs> the Hilbert space itself is, is 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 things with two two indices. So so it's operators itself. Uh, yeah yeah. Yeah so yeah so so you, yeah another way of writing it would be you multi so the, the the representation on H is a tensor with the identity or left multiplication or whatever. Yeah I, I'm sorry I couldn't find a good notation to. Yeah, I'm sorry if I'm confusing you. Anyway, so let, let's let's prove this. And um, yeah, so I I don't know how to. So this is a couple of lines. It, it, it all looks very boring, and, and it's not very interesting calculation. So you say that V on A, you know, on this row in your Hilbert space. So what is this supposed to be? It's, uh, by definition, it's um, T on A, uh, um, row primed uh, on row. And what was this inner product? It's the trace, it's the Hilbert Schmidt in a product, so you have to write it itself as a trace of rho uh, T of A 
P of A. And so that's the definition of the Hilbert, sp Hilbert space in a product there. And then um, there's an inequality here, the, in fact the only one, that you can say that this row and this as an operator is less than or equal to A star and A. So this, co this follows from the completely positive property. And so I'm not going to prove this. This, this is... A, and, and then you say this is um, by definition T tilde of rho of A star and A. And, but this is just rho primed. So this is the trace of uh, rho prime of A star and A. And again, by the definition of the inner product, this is uh, A on rho primed in the Hilbert space. I guess it's, I, draw, I think it should be square here. Anyway, but th what this is saying is that the operator norm is one because the, the norm of an operator is the, is the smallest constant by which the length of a vector can increase, the sort of the smallest factor by which the length of a vector can increase. Yeah? So it's the largest eigenvalue and that's just expressing that the length of the vector cannot increase and therefore the oper operator norm is less than or equal to one. Okay, so now comes uh, some tricks that you can play. Um, So, so this is all from a paper from PETS in the 80s. So, so, so this, this data processing inequality, so all the big shots from analysis, they were trying to prove this. So, so this is not, not, not a joke. But if you do it right, you can just do it in, in a few lines. And, and that's sort of, to me, characteristic of this, many of these ideas. You just need the right idea and then everything is just three lines. But if you, you can spend weeks on finding the right idea. So it's, it's different from calculating loop amplitudes where you immediately fill page and page and page. So it's different, different style. So next idea. So this involves some other idea, uh, some, something called an operator monotone function. So an operator monotone function f, uh, it goes from the positive reals to the positive reals. So what would be an ordinary monotone function? It's just a function that, well, not exactly not like this, but you know, how you would like the stock market to go if, if you start to invest and how it never goes. So, so I always invest here when, when afterwards it goes. So, but this is an, a monotone function, you know. But an operator monotone function is, is, is something much more restrictive. So if you have two operators, let's say A, uh, and an operator A is greater than or equal to some operator B, and, and that's greater than zero. So what that means is that A minus B any matrix element is positive. So or equivalently that all eigenvalues of A minus B, so, so this implicitly assumes that A and B are Hermitian, yeah? so, so you have uh, uh, eigenvalues. So A minus B should have no zero negative eigenvalue. That's, that's what, what is meant by this. So, so then you can... Uh, hi, so, yeah. sorry to bring you back. But can you please say again, real quick, how to use complete positivity in that proof? I use complete positivity in this step because complete positivity implies this, this inequality. As operators, so it's the same sort of inequality. Right, how can I see that? And uh, th there's a, a cute matrix trick to see that, which uh, so it, it's not easy. Not if you don't know how to do it, it's not not obvious. I say, yeah. But um, if if you say if if T is sort of the von Neumann measurement where you take A to P P A P, you know, then this has a P in the middle, and this hasn't. So so it's clear that this one is bigger. 
Yeah, so, so in this example, you see it. And then in, in all the other, two, the other two basic channels, it's, it's an equality. And therefore, because it's, it's, you can compose an arbitrary channel from this, you, you see it, you, you see it, that's one way to see it. Thanks. Okay. So, but what is operator monotone means that um, when A is bigger than B, then also F of A should be bigger than F of B. And, and so, sort of if A and B commute, then you can diagonalize them both. And then it's just a trivial statement. Then it just means monotonic because it's, it's just one eigenvalue is then bigger than the other. But if A and B don't commute, this is not at all obvious why, why a, a general monotone function should, should satisfy this. And in fact, it doesn't. So, so an, an operator monotone function is of a very special form. So if, if this is satisfied, then you call, so for all F operator. So, so, give, so here's an, an exercise, another one. So I take the function f of x to be 1 over t plus x inverse, where t is uh, greater than 0. So show that this is operator monotone. Uh, so I give you a hint. So, so the way that you do it is you, you, you want to show a bigger than b, so you define an interpolation between a and b, something like this, lambda a plus 1 minus lambda b. And then you try to prove that d by d lambda of f of c lambda as an operator is always greater than or equal to 0, because then, uh, yeah, I think it's the right way. Excuse me, Stefan. Yes. Uh, here. Yes. Uh, I, I'm still, this is probably a very stupid question, but you defined the operator monotone function as a function from R plus to R plus. Yeah. And then you fed in an operator. Do you just feed in every, every eigenvalue and then that yeah, defines so, so the I, other operator? Uh, so for, for a function of an operator, I define like this. So first I, I write the operator as, um, uh, you know, U times a diagonal matrix times U star. Yeah, okay. And then I define it to be U and then alpha F of the diagonal matrix times you start. So, so f of a diagonal matrix then is just the f applied to every uh, every matrix element. Okay, so this is operator monotone, and then um, that, that's a that's a, a calculation that goes in the way that I describe, because f increases in under this um, this interpolating family. But, but then you can, you can build from this elementary example more complicated operator monotone functions. I think I'm always working this. So it turns out, and this is, this is sort of a, a, a result from sort of 1970s or 60s even mathematics, so that the most general operator monotone function you can always write in the sum in the following way that is one plus some parameter t x plus t and then um, some weight uh, some weight function of t which is greater than or equal to zero dt and um, so that gives you for each weight function that gives you an operator monotone function and why is it operator monotone because you can the integrand is operator monotone, you can sort of easily reduce it to this case, that I, this basic case. And then um, if you take an integral from uh, minus infinity, from zero to infinity, uh, then, then a, a sum of operator monotone functions is always operator monotone, that's easy to see. And, and so, so that's easy, but then that the most general operator monotone functions is, is of this uh, form, it's not so easy to see. Another uh, another way to characterize it is, is with, um, with functions that have a, an analytic continuation into the positive, um, uh, into the positive uh, uh, um, complex plane, the upper complex plane with, with certain properties. But, but 
So then you can uh, understand from this that um, this is another exercise uh, that this is for operator monotone as well. And um, the log is operator monotone, but this only for alpha between 0 and 1. So find, find the corresponding weight function here. So write it this way, and then you know it's operator monotone. Yeah. Yes, for some, for some weight function. Question. Yes? Yeah, so his question was whether my statement had been that every operator monotone function can be written this way, and the answer to this question is yes. For some, for some W that you can choose, but it has to be positive. And, and okay, so uh, is, 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 it, is it something like I can choose a different factor and that would just give me another sort of yeah. weight function? Yeah, so or I, is I'm, this inviting you, I'm inviting you to find that W which gives you this. Oh, no, no, I, I mean, is there something unique about that, the, the prefact, the, the integrand part without yeah, the, the weight function? The, yeah, the, this integrand is basically this example because you can divide numerator and denominator by x and then you get x inverse and then you can, can sort of wh whether the t is, is here or there doesn't matter. Right, right. And my, my question is, is there something unique about this combination or can I choose another combination, like so, some, some other combination that might work which will give me some other like weight? Uh, yeah, I think you can also get a representation in terms of this with some integral over alpha and uh -huh. some other weight function. Yeah, okay, I, think, okay. I think that's possible. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, yeah, that's true. Thank okay. you. Hmm. But, but this one is, is, is particularly convenient because often you have, it's, it's easier to, 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 uh, uh, to learn something about this. So, so let's, uh, so we're going to need the log because for our relative entropy, we want to take, we want to take the, the, the modular operators. The, does this, it looks like an integral transform. Does this have a name? Over here. Sorry, I, uh, Does that have a name? It looks like an integral transform. Like, is it a named thing? Uh, no, but this, this result has a name, which, what is the name? I don't think, it's Levner's theorem is different. Pick possibly. You, you're more learned than me, I don't know what's the name. Yeah, but uh, it's, it's a household theorem, it's in, in you can find it. Um, I think it's, it, it's not Levner's theorem, possibly, it's called that. Sorry for, for my ignorance. And, and, but you were asking what, what this function, this kernel is called? Or, or yeah, yeah. It, it, this has a name. I don't know. Okay. Names. What are names? Right. So now I want to come back, pick up the thread. Hopefully I haven't lost it completely. So, there's another marvelous thing about operator monotonic function. So, if... Uh, F is, is operator monotone, and um, and V is such that um, uh, it's a contraction, so a linear operator that can only shrink the length of a vector. It doesn't have to be unitary or anything. Then you can show that as operators F of X and V is always less than or equal to F of V, X, V. Again, so these are non, totally non-commuting things, so it's, it's quite surprising that you can get something for, even though nothing commutes with each other. So, now let's uh, complete the proof. So now you apply this, this thing to the modular operator. So you, we, uh, we learn that um, so let's look at V log delta rho and sigma. That's the one that appears in the relative entropy. And now use this because we know log is operator monotone, so I can put this inside. Rho and sigma. So where I'm using here this, uh, what I've shown before. And um, and then um, you can also see that, um, that this 
this thing here is less than or equal to a rho, del rho of and sigma primed again as an operator. So they give you this as another exercise. And so be because it's operator monotone using this again, we have that this is log of rho prime and sigma prime. And then um, you complete the proof the following way. So you say that S of uh, rho prime and sigma prime is um, minus rho prime uh, log of uh, rho prime and sigma prime like this. And then um, I'm using this inequality here to show that this is less than or equal to minus uh, um, rho prime v star And then um, I just bring this V over here and uh, use that this is then, this is equal to minus V of But this is by construction just square root of rho and this is square root of rho and so this is S, this is minus, no, this is S of uh, rho and sigma. And you've shown it. Okay, so this is, um, I just wanted to show you some tools that you, you use it when, when you, when you uh, try to prove such kind of things. Um, and and I'll, I'll show you more as, as we go along. And if you do all the exercises, you will be a big expert afterwards. And, uh, uh, know how to do it. Okay, so now I want to, uh, I, I take this data processing inequality as known. Uh, this way of doing it has a, has a great amount of flexibility and, and it's used in many modern proofs uh, in the quantum information literature sort of recent years. They, they all use, so many, many, for many things, this, this kind of method with the V and operator monotone function, blah, blah, blah. This is, uh, uh, this is, this is the way that, that they prove things. Or ma prove many things, not everything, of course. I think Leibniz theorem is something else. But I so, I just one question. Yeah. Uh, maybe I missed something, but when did we prove that the that log of delta was an operator monotone? We didn't prove it. I claimed it to you, and um, I. I, I claim that x to the alpha is operator monotone and it's, it was an exercise for you to find this weight and this weight, weight function in, 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 ah. uh, and check that it's positive. Uh, and, and then you take, just when you do the path integral, the replica trick, you, you write the log as a sort of limit of x to the alpha. Mm -hmm. So that's one way. You can also find the weight function directly for, for log as well. So now what, uh, uh, let's now come to von Neumann algebras. So, so far we've just done matrices, but uh, um, I've done it in such a way that, that it can be generalized to von Neumann algebras. That's another advantage of this method. So, but what is a von Neumann? <coughs> what is a von Neumann algebra, and and why should we care about von Neumann algebras and not some other algebra? So, uh, so it's it's a bound. It consists of bounded operators on some Hilbert space, and um, so you can. So the product is supposed. So it's supposed to be an algebra. Uh, and it's supposed to be 
closed under the star. Now, don't ask me why physically one has to have this, but um, um, so I guess we take products because we multiply observables with each other classically. I, I don't, I, I mean, this is a, uh, you know, but, but it's an accepted viewpoint anyway. Nobody questions it. And the adjoint, you need it for everything. So, so, but then there's some other property of it. So, it, so it should be closed or complete, whatever, with respect to, to the following sort of norms where you took, take two vectors where you consider matrix elements. So you say if, if you have a, a sequence of eggs such that they are a Cauchy sequence for every matrix element, yeah, then you want the, the limit to be in, in the von Neumann algebra. So, so it's, it's sort of set, it's convergence under matrix elements. So, so you close it in, in such a way that, um, that taking matrix elements is, an, is, a, is a continuous uh, operation. So von Neumann, I guess he, he, he said, I, I'm not sure who, uh, who, who said. So, so there's a something called the standard form. Sorry, can I quickly ask, uh, what, what, what do you mean by a star, star algebra? Uh, um, star algebra. is just the, the Hermitian adjoint. Is, so if some element is in A, then also its Hermitian adjoint is in A. Just like in a group, you say its inverse should be in the group and the oh, product okay. should be in the group. Okay. So here you have the star. Okay, so mm. it just means the uh, yeah. adjoint should be yeah. in the so algebra yeah. as well. So, okay. so, so, yeah. um, but anyway, so, so, so then there's something called the standard form. Uh, and that's something, um, something that's uh, related to purification. So it's, it's this, it's sort of an abstraction of this purification thing that, that sort of is, is trivial for, for, uh, for matrices. So you, so you say this Hilbert space, so H is the Hilbert space, that, that should contain, this is not quite what people call the standard form technically, but it should contain a vector such that the following are true. So, so if you apply A to, to this vector, let's call it uh, omega, then this is basically all of H. And so people draw a star, so maybe you have to do a completion or something. So if you think about the example where the Hilbert space was, was sort of you act from the left or what you said, tensor product with one, and you act on, on a vector you know, a vector in this in this big Hilbert space is sort of is sort of the purification of a density matrix. So if that density matrix has no zero eigenvalues, then then you obtain such a uh, such an A. So, so it's it's sort of like saying that the reduced density matrix of this row has no zero eigenvalues. And then the other condition is that A on omega equal to zero implies that A is equal to zero. So, so you know, normally you think that that's nonsense because you th always think of the irreducible representation and the fact that A annihilates one vector doesn't normally mean that A is zero. But, but you have to remember that A is this, in the matrix uh, algebra case, this is sort of the doubled Hilbert space where, where you act with left multiplication and this omega is, is, some, is, some, um, is itself some, uh, uh, some matrix with no, which doesn't have zero eigenvalues. So, so then, so so the in quantum field theory, uh, you take for example omega to be the vacuum, and you take a to be let's say uh, any any local algebras associated with some region O. So maybe here's a little O. I'm I'm using this convention that O usually. Uh, refers to the space-time uh, sort of diamonds. And then um, I claim that this is in standard form. And, and this is basically the riesz leader theorem. So what you have to show is that, um, for example, that any vector, so the first condition here, states that any, any vector 
in the Hilbert space can be approximated by a sort of A on the vacuum where A is, is just a local is a local algebra. Yeah, so this corresponds to this condition here. Uh, I'm just writing it differently. Yeah? So this, this means that I apply, I can get anything here from a suitable A on omega. And, and, and likewise, this uh, other thing is quite clear. So how do we prove this? Yes. What, what, what do you mean by approximated? Well, it's this thing that you have to, you, you may have to take a closure so, so you can approximate it to, to arbitrary precision. So, so if, if the state is like Disney, ca so Disney Castle behind the moon, then even here I could, you know, whatever it means, I apply A to the vacuum, but let, let's suppose that that means something for an experimenter. But I could apply a suitably, a judiciously chosen, in, you know, operator from just here, just from, from this lab. This, uh, right, but and get and create this castle behind the moon. This is the usual pattern. You know, people think of it as as a, as a paradox, but but you, you know, you would never figure out what this operator is. You could never do it. But right, but it should, shouldn't shouldn't be an exact like way of writing it. It's just dense. Yeah. It, it's what? If you, I think it's a footprint. Don't worry. If if you you know you don't make a mistake by thinking that it's ex exactly. Uh, okay. uh, you see the. But uh, technically, you have to take a, a limit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think here's a question here. I, I thought that the resolution of the castle on the moon issue was that in the lab here we could only act with unitary operators. And the that's right. Yeah. So so a so so if 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 the castle on the moon you you know that if let's say that's a state vector, it has unit norm. You know we, we'd have to apply an a with, with an absolutely huge magnitude. To this, to this, uh, so so we'd we'd have to find some way of, of doing, of doing that. But it, this can, this uh, anyway, that, that the cost of, of creating this castle, you know, is is, is sort of a question that's more related to complexity. This is just some silly silly theorem, and and the way that you prove it is like this. So you you go to a slightly bigger O here, or let's say this is O, and I go to a slightly smaller one. And now I take any vector and I take e to the i, z, mu, p, mu on a, e to the minus i, z, mu, p, mu on the vacuum. So let, let's call this function g of z. So z is a, is a, is a four vector and a is from this slightly smaller um, uh, uh, um. uh, well, let's see how long. Yeah, so, so um, well, maybe I'll do this later actually. So let me do this later. I don't want because I want to say something. Let, I'll give you the proof later for this. Um, and maybe because we'll do similar things, uh, maybe I, I, I'm a bit short of time now. So I want to come to, to th this is the Riesz leader theorem and, and you, sh you, sh you prove it next time if you want, I give you the proof. Um, but but there's, as you probably know, there, there's a, a set of, of lecture, um, these this notes by Ed Witten, which, which are sort of have, have this levels of stuff, you know, have lots of stuff and, and they have this kind of argument in there. So I, c I couldn't explain it any better. So, so, so I'll, I'll, I'll refer you to this and if I have time, I'll give you the proof. So just uh, the existence of this vector omega, it's a requirement for the Hilbert space to have a von Neumann It's the vacuum. It, is, it is, has to be the vacuum or, s or a vector of, min of, of finite energy. But I mean, what's the connection between that and the von Neumann algebra? Like, is one a requirement for the other? No, the, the, the connection is that you can kind of prove that this is true based on the properties of the vacuum, which is, is that it's in, invariant under translations and that the generator of translations or the Hamiltonian is positive. But that's it's a combination of these facts. That's not necessary to have von Neumann algebra, is no, it? No, no. This I is like physically. Yeah, you know, so this is not logically 
you know, I, I'm I'm go to quantum field theory, and and then and then they have lots more structures. I have translations. I have a vacuum. I have you know translate positive energy momentum. Blah blah blah. And you know, it's not something that is totally general. Okay, okay. May, I was giving the wrong impression. Just as an exa as sort of an example for why these are reasonable sort of assumptions that we often have. So, um, for a reach leader to be true here, A sub O, the O are just local operators in this space-time region you're yes. considering, right? We're not assuming anything else. They're no, they're just local, I mean, and I have to assume somehow for the argument that there's something called additivity, which, which is sort of evident to anybody using operator formalism. You know, that if, you, if I take operators locally here and then I apply them everywhere, so then I can just move them around and generate everything. Sort of that, that, that sort of also implicitly assumes. So, so lots of things are implicitly assumed, but nothing unreasonable, I think. Okay, so additivity and some other things. Yeah, additivity and positive, positivity of energy in any frame, yeah. Right, so now come the, the, the types of von Neumann algebras, which is where I'm getting, you know, I, I'm, I'm re I, don't, I don't know how much I should tell you and how much you, you want to know. But um, so, so Mori and von Neumann, I don't know, they made this def definition in, during the Second World War in the 40s. And, and then von Neumann, he, he kind of... Uh, you know, he invented basically what we, the formalism of quantum mechanics as we use it today. And he somehow thought it was interesting to, to see what you could get when you start from this sort of physically motivated definition uh, that you have, you know. And, and, he, and, and with a student, I guess, or, or I don't know, with Mur a guy called Murray, he, he kind of started this. And, and he started to classify what, what you could have uh, based on... on on, on projections and, and sort of one possibility is that you have just the bounded operators on Excuse some me, Stefan. space. Yes? You just said that this was a physically motivated definition. Well. Can you explain well, it's, it's, the it's third part especially, like how would you physically... This one? No, yeah. no, the standard form, uh, so that's not a requirement. So these two are requirement. The standard form is that something that you can always do. So, so you can always put the von Neumann algebra on a, on a doubled Hilbert space if you want to. And, and, then, and then you can always find this kind of vector, basically. But if you don't, then there, there's something else has to replace that criterion, right? So this is not really, so these are the two criteria. Uh, but then you show that you can, you, you can find a representation on, on, on a Hilbert space, oh. so, uh, uh, on this double Hilbert space, such that this is true. So, so this is sort of a very complicated thing to prove, actually. I mean, not for, I see. Not so, for sorry, matrices. So, so I misunderstood. Not so, for so, matrices. so the definition is only the first two the, items. The first here. two are the definitions, uh, uh, and the, the, the third one is, is sort of an existence theorem of a purification. That, but, but you want to. You would like to assume that, that you are in this representation, for example, because in quantum field theory you automatically are in such, such a representation. But, but the existence of this standard form is something that was proved only in the, you know, by some famous mathematicians sort of in some incomprehensible papers. It's, it's very complicated. But uh, A, uh, sort of anyway, the one, one possibility is, is this. And if it acts just on K, it's not in the standard form. But if it acts on H, which is k, you know, k tensor. If you tensor in the, the, the entangled degrees of freedom, then it's in a standard representation. And then that's not, that's not a big deal. Um, but so then... Uh, sorry, yes? just, just one question. So then your vector omega uh, leaves in a tensor product of h's, right? Uh, then your, the vector omega that you're needing the standard form is going to leave in the tensor product yeah, of the so Hilbert the, the, spaces? The omega leaves in the tensor product. I guess you know, you would often write this as sort of, you know, that one is O primed and one is O, and, and sort of these are the degrees of freedom outside and inside, so sort of. Okay, and uh, the closure is taken with respect to, because, well, if it was just in the regular Hilbert space, you would have uh, an inner product that you could use to yeah, define so the closure. So if it's this Hilbert-Schmidt inner product, you know. You, oh, the, the inner product that you have in the tensor product, okay, okay, okay. 
you know, you think of something in here, this has two indices, so it's like an operator, mm -hmm. and, and then okay, okay. this is the Hilbert space, in, in a Hilbert Schmidt in a product. Okay, and that A operator is only acting on the first component, right? Yes, when you say that... A acts only on here, you know, a with as A tends to... I see, I see, okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yes, in, in the standard representation. So, so I don't know how much... So, so the, way the, the way this is characterized is that there, there's a minimal projection. So a minimal projection is, is a projection such there's no smaller projection. So it's, it's just a projection uh, onto a, a single pure state. Yeah? So obviously you can't have... Uh, <laughs> it's already just rank one. And so, 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 so this case is characterized by the fact that you have a minimal projection. There's no projection that's smaller than E, this minimal projection. So in other words, you have pure states in this case. Yeah? So the pure states are the image of this minimal projection. Or you can say there exist pure states. And, and so, so, in, so in the second, in the, for the type two, um, so, so there, uh, the funny thing in the general case is you, you may think that you're going to get down to, 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 the, to the basement where, where you, you have a minimal projection onto a pure state and then you cannot sort of project it further. But, but in, in the general type case, you can always go further down. So, th so there's never a limit. So to, any proje to most projections, there's always one that's below. And um, uh, so there's, there's here type one, which has, uh, you know, I, I don't want to write out the, the formal definitions, of, so, but, but, but sort of the idea is, um, uh, uh, so, so the definition is that, um, so that uh, type two, there exists a finite projection. So what's a finite, so there's lots of jargon. A finite projection is, uh, is, is, is a projection is called finite, uh, so E finite. If, um, uh, if F, there's an F below it and, um, and E is equivalent to F. So that, and that in turn means that E is V, V star for some isometry and F is V star V. So, so for, for, for normal matrices, if you know V dagger V is one, you know it's unitary, and then V, the other, the other order is also one. But, but in this general type, so this, this doesn't have to be the case. So you can get different things. So, so, so somehow the intuition is, is wrong. And so then the type one case is where you have, you have a normalized trace. So, so sort of it's like a functional, an expectation value functional which has the same property as the trace. So you can, you can do cyclic permutations, but yet it's not a finite dimension and it's normalized. So if you put in one, you get one, but yet it's not a finite dimensional algebra. Yeah? So if you, if, you take, if you take the usual trace, you, are, you know, if you want to make, you want to normalize it, you have to divide by one over n the dimension of the Hilbert space. And if, if the Hilbert space is infinitely large, then, then, then you would have to divide by, by infinity. So, so in this case here, you, you don't have a normalized trace, but somehow in the type one case you have. It, it's sort of not very intuitive. What is, what is this projection E? Is it an operator in the algebra? Or are you saying you're getting Yeah, it's, it's in E. So, so there, there exists a finite projection and finite projection means um, there's an operator uh, 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 E and uh, b uh, F below E such that um, uh, they are related in this so, way. So what's your starting point? Are you getting type 1 and 2 from an original starting point? Or are you saying that a no, polynomial no, no, algebra with no, number okay. by this has these operators? Yeah, so, so, so what you do is first, so first you say you, you go to factors. So, well, maybe I should have defined a factor. So, so, the, so you can define the operators commuting with A. And then if you call it a factor if, if 
this is zero, or just to consist of just the identity. And so the, the, the story is first you, you go to every von Neumann algebra, you can decompose into factors just like blocks, sort of. And then this is a classification more precisely uh, of the factors. Yeah? And so any factor can be one of the types one, two, or three. But what you have depends what was given to you. So, so, so you have to find, uh, nobody would check to find these projections. So you, they're usually there are other criteria. But then there's type, I want to mention type three also. And then we'll stop. And then the type three, uh, so, the, the, uh, so the type three there doesn't exist to find it. So a type three factor does not have any pure states. Uh, so, so that's sort of an illusion that you have in quantum mechanics. There, there's no pure state on a type, type three factor. Every state is entangled with something. It has to be always be entangled with something. And um, sort of this is uh, what you get uh, in, in quantum field theory under the usual assumptions. And then um, type two is, is what you can get when you when you put a quantum field in a, not in a thermal state, but in, a, in an infinite temperature state, then, then formally you get a type two factor, a type two one. Or, um, some people have, have, have recently argued that in quantum gravity, maybe you get type two. And um, type one is sort of uh, irreducible representation. So that's your usual quantum mechanics. You always have type one. Anyway, so this is uh, just a little bit of background. I wanted to give you maybe some examples later uh, and how you check, you know, what are criteria for knowing whether it's type one, two, three. Um, um, but then uh, I think for today I have to call it a day, I guess, right? Any questions? Sorry, uh, just just to clarify, what, what what did you mean by a minimal projection? So, by what do I mean by what? A minimal project projection. Yeah, so, a minimal projection is is one that you don't have a projection. Uh, so, a projection is defined by it projects onto some subspace, yeah, your yes. shadow, and a, 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 a smaller projection projects onto a sub subspace which is inside that subspace. Okay. Okay. So, so in some sense. This is the smallest thing, so like a 1D, if, if yeah. your so you know, is you know, one dimensional. Usually you would say, well, clearly it's 1D. You know, you, once you're down to 1D subspace, you can't go to 0D subspace because that's not, you know, but okay. because that cannot be a projection. Right, right. But, so but that, that's the funny thing that, that uh, that's, well, that characterizes type 1, but not the other types. In the other types, they're, they're, you, you can't just go to the... 1D and then that's it. Right, right. But so, so your definition of minimal projection is going all the way to 1D, like yeah. states. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Well, the, the definition didn't say 1D, but, but when you, you, do, you, you do a little more work, you see it's 1D. Yeah, yeah. Um, right here. So going back to the Riesz Leader theorem part, yeah. so you, you said um, that in the algebra in region L, we assume that it satisfies additivity and positive energy density, but I thought... No, positive, the, Hamil the Hamiltonian is, uh, as, as known, has no okay, uh, negative positive eigenvalues, right. yes. Okay, the because there are negative energy densities. Oh, no, no, it's not about energy, it's about the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian, the, the great. Full, the, en the total energy, yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, 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 very good point, yeah. So um, in the case of type 2, 1, uh, when you have a normalized trace, um, I guess you can still make sense of the notion of density operator, uh, uh, right? Uh, um, because you have a trace defined for every element. Not really. I mean, you can't, you know, normally you would say, what is the, what is the density operator for trace state? So, right, it's the state with, with all the eigenvalues equal, right? Yeah. But, but they can't be all one because then it's not normalized, but the algebra is infinite dimensional, so you know, there, there's nothing, it's the wrong mental picture, I think. Okay. Mm -hmm. More questions? 
If not, let's thank you, Stefan, again.